All right, hello, hello. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to ETHCC. Super exciting to be here on Monday, kicking off everything. So I hope you're excited as I am. Uh, my name is Micah Isogawa. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Webacy. And my talk, typically when I do talks at events, it's kind of safety, security, technical related, which this partially is. But more importantly, um, I'm going to talk about something that's probably pretty interesting, and that is how other people self-custody their crypto. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. So very briefly on my background, uh, I'm Japanese, which is the best country ever. So you'll see my uh, influence in the slides. I studied st uh, AI at Stanford, machine learning. Um, I was a performer for Cirque du Soleil in a past life, um, and that's actually when I first was introduced to crypto back in 2014. So um, kind of a weird introduction into the space. Uh, and then most recently, I was at Microsoft doing cybersecurity with the government. And then in 2021, I founded my company. And if we have time at the end, I'll tell you briefly about what it's about, but we won't do much about that. That's my pr uh, professional life and my personal life. I'm great at parties, so I will see you this week. Uh, so what are we going to go through today? I didn't want to do anything too boring. And so what I've actually done is I spent the last couple months in interviewing 20 to 25 crypto OGs. These are guys that have been in the space since 2010, 2011, some of the early, early, early protocol devs of all the companies that you've prob probably heard of. I won't tell you who they are, uh, but I will do some case studies and also tell you some commonalities I found across the space. And then I'll also talk about a couple new things in self-custody. Um, I won't talk about account abstraction because I'm sure you'll hear about it from everyone else here, but I'll talk about everything else that's going on. And then Webacy at the end. So we'll go through those three points. So I am also not doxing any of these uh, names for very obvious reasons, um, but I will give them fake names. So case number one, uh, this guy was an early protocol dev at one of the top 10 L1s. If I named it, you would know it. Been in crypto since 2016, so not the earliest of the ones I've interviewed, but still very interesting. Uh, he's a self-proclaimed alt-chain bro, um, and he was involved before any traditional like hardware support of the big companies that we know and love today. Um, so he's really been in the self-custody evolution and seen it change from the very beginning, from when he built his own self-custody to the companies that came out and how they've evolved over the years. So he self-custodies his stuff by running his own scripts. So he's paid out in tokens, or it was historically paid out in tokens, and then he would run a script to automatically split to his cold storage wallets. Um, one commonality across every single interview I had was that people did not have accounts on custodians or they did only for on-ramps and off-ramps, and they did not hold assets on them. So that's one thing across all 20, uh, it's 24 interviews. Uh, that was very interesting to me. Um, and then he also doesn't use hardware wallets um, for anything other than the main tokens. And one reason for that was that he didn't believe in the support for them until after they were battle tested. So he'd typically wait one or two years from the release of the support for a particular token before feeling comfortable moving those tokens onto the hardware. So he usually does his own hardware support. Case number two, this is the most interesting one. Uh, so he is a current cybersecurity engineer, one of the major um, leading security firms in the space. These are one of the firms that do audits, code reviews, things like that. Uh, he's been in crypto since 2015. So of all of the interviews I did, 80 to 85% of everyone, they're all guys. They were all dudes that I was interviewing. Um, they told me that they got into crypto because of you know, nefarious purposes, whether it be drugs or gambling or something like that. The other 15% that I interviewed, they lied about it. So everyone got in through the dark web. So this guy, again, he doesn't use centralized exchanges. He holds only BTC and ETH. And so this, he's kind of also a hacker, so he gets paid out in bug bounty. Um, and when he receives any kind of token of any kind, he immediately swaps to ETH and BTC. Uh, he wouldn't really tell me why, but you could probably make assumptions about it. Um, he, so this, he uses USBs and his own built hardware devices of other kinds. He doesn't use third-party hardware devices. And he also mentioned you know, building defense in depth, so across all of the layers, from web two to web three, all the access. The most interesting part of this, so he was inspired by, I can't remember the TV show, but there's a TV show where this guy puts secret phrases inside of music using steganography. It's a crypto cryptographic term for putting data into other files. So he developed his own script to splice the seed phrase and put them into movies. Um, and so he puts these U movies onto a USB stick. He has many copies around the world. And so he can watch his favorite movies, but it's also his seed phrase. Uh, so it's a custom script to decode it as well on the other end. It's extremely complicated, but it's also very much my favorite case study that I had from these interviews. Um, it's also quite complicated. So a couple of things of, that he noted. Um, he doesn't trust hardware wallets um, made by third parties. Particularly, he mentioned a couple years ago, I don't know if you remember, there, there was this issue 
uh, where the Kraken security team found that there was a, uh, like a supply chain attack against Ledger, and this has been dealt with, of course, but there is that uh, attack vector. I also asked everybody, what happens if you, you know, die? Like, how do you recover these assets? Um, he very bluntly said that these assets would be lost forever, and it's a significant amount. Um, so a lot of uh, blockchain assets have been lost due to people passing away unexpectedly or expectedly, but people just don't know how to access them. So that was one funny thing. Some tips from a technological level. He was pretty clear that some scripts for decoding and coding uh, does not run the same across chains. So when you're doing your own thing, if you plan to do something more hardcore, test across chains before you try to actually implement because when you go to actually decode things, it might not work across, let's say, Solana, Ethereum, and so on. Uh, he also mentioned that a good piece of entropy is actually more than 30 characters, so your passwords are all probably a little bit too short, um, but it's also too long for you to memorize, so it's kind of a chicken and egg problem when it comes to good security. Third case, crypto founder. This guy, really, really OG, so crypto founder since 2011. He started by doing sketchy stuff on Silk Road, has been doing things like Bitcoin, all trading, and so on. 100% self-custody. So same thing across the board. Majority of these guys do not trust any centralized exchanges. So they hold entirely on self-custody. His staking payouts go to his multi-sig. He transfers um, from sexes to off-ramp pr primarily. He doesn't seem to care about identity, which is one another interesting thing, is that a lot of these guys did not care if they were KI'd seed into their accounts. And then he was also reminding me of, if you've been on Reddit for a long time with crypto, that bird math meme of a guy, so I'll explain it. Um, they were, it was about hardware self-custody. And he had put his seed phrase on a USB device, puts it in a box, and puts it under his birdbath in the backyard. And that was his defense, right? And so it's, it just goes to give you a story about how complicated it could be and how, how unrealistic it can also be at the same time. So the next part of my talk, I want to go through two different EIPs that are related to self-custody in the space and kind of uh, on the innovative front that are not account abstraction. So the first one, 3074, uh, this is a new opcode to allow externally owned accounts to delegate control to a contract. So both of these are kind of about expanding the power of EOAs. Uh, so you can delegate control of your EOA to a contract and it kind of acts like a smart contract wallet, but it is not a smart contract wallet, so it's an alternative. If you know this meme, uh, acts like one, quacks like one, it's not. It's a, one of the new EIPs. So this allows four things called sponsored transactions, so you can pay a trans pay for the gas of a transaction from somewhere else. So if you're someone like me, I don't keep ETH in my account so that you can't, a hacker can't send anything out of it. Um, there's like a wallet drainer system on it, so there's no ETH. You can actually still do transactions with that account by sponsoring uh, the gas fees from a different account. The next one, 5806, so this is a delegate transaction. Uh, you've probably heard of delegate cash. Um, I actually don't know what they use, uh, but this is one of the EIPs that are within the system right now. So it allows EOAs to actually arbitrarily execute uh, code through delegation. So again, this is a new approach. It also has some replay risks. Um, there are some mitigations to that. But it's very similar to how EIP7 allows um, smart contracts to delegate calls to other smart contracts. So which allows for batch transactions, which is something really great if you have been, been using any Web3 apps that requires you to you know, approve, approve, approve. This is something that is quite innovative and great. And it gives it more abilities to EOAs, which is what we want. And then this is some of the mitigations you can do for replays, which makes things safer but less powerful than 3074. Now in the few minutes that I have left, the company Webacy, so what we do is we do self-custody security. We're not a wallet, we're not a safe, we're not a vault of any kind, we are actually a layer on top so you can bring any self-custody wallet you have to us and use it. And we do three main things. We assess risk, we monitor your wallets, and we help you act in an emergency. So we have a risk platform, you can pretty much assess what that is. Uh, we take data from a bunch of different sources and tell you about the risk of your wallet transactions, smart contracts you've interacted with, and so on. We have a wallet monitoring service. So every one of you, you're not on your computers right now, I assume you might be. Uh, but if, let's say, I get a text of something leaving my wallet, I know it wasn't me because I'm talking to you right now, and so that's something to be concerned about. So it provides both peace of mind and also knowledge about what's happening in your wallet. So it's all inbound, all outbound, airdrops, royalty payments, you get notified through SMS and email. And then two other things that we've built. It's a backup wallet to recover. This is a loss of access recovery method that's not social um, recovery. It's not seed phrase sharding. It's all through self-custody ownership, as well as a panic, oh shit, emergency evacuation button in case you have things moving out of your wallet. Finally, funny enough, this is a, the very first product we built, kind of touching back on the question I was asking everyone. We have a crypto will. 
So on-chain inheritance, how do you pass things on to your loved ones after you pass away, which we all inevitably will. Um, this is some pictures of the platform. It's all totally live. We launched one month ago out of beta. Um, and yeah, I'll pause there. I think I have a few minutes for questions. But other than that, thank you very much. Uh, Self-custody safely. What do I use? I can't tell you that. <laughs> no, I use a variety of things. So I have multiple cold storage, I have a multi-sig, and then I use hot wallets that are basically burners to interact. Cool. Thank you.